Okay. Be warned, I've had so much caffeine now. I'm like 99% caffeine. And those of you who know me know I'm fairly energetic anyway. So with caffeine, I'm just dangerous. So um, thank you so much for being here today. This has been, from my point of view, absolutely brilliant. I think it's been really, really fun. Lots of interaction, lots of things talked about. Brilliant presentations earlier on. Um, brilliant speech from Lord Eben and really, really good conversation. So we are in our last uh, section. I am what is between you and whichever motorway you're going home on, which is always a dangerous position. But this bit should be really fun. We've got a panel discussion. We've got four brilliant panellists here. Um, I'm going to get them in to introduce themselves in just a second. But specifically chosen for their varying skills and characteristics and positions within the livestock industry. So it um, should be really interesting. I'm going to throw them what are hopefully some fairly soft and easy questions and then throw it open to all of you guys for your questions. And hoping that you're going to be taking home sort of thoughts and um, comments and ideas about what you can do on your operation or in your business, whatever that is, wherever that is within the agriculture industry in terms of moving forward. So with no further ado, I'm going to move on to the panel. We have Nigel, we have Flavian, we have Paul, and we have Stephen. Um, obviously, you um, heard from Stephen this morning. So we're going to start with Nigel, and they're going to do a quick introduction to who they are, what they do, and then we'll move into the questions. Okay, so I, I'm Nigel. I'm probably the furthest away from livestock. Um, you, you probably noticed by the, by the title, Malt Doctor, uh, that suggests which uh, part of the chain I'm in. So I spent 25 years in uh, malting and brewing and did a lot of sustainability work there. And about three years ago, I remember having a conversation with the MD that 80% of my enjoyment was coming from 10% of the job, which wasn't sustainable. And the 80% I enjoyed was doing sustainability and helping debunk some of the myths that are out there. And on the back of decarbonizing the company I was with by 90%, I thought, let's go and try doing that with some other people. So uh, that's what I really enjoy doing now, and it's great being your own boss. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Flavian Obiero, and I feel lost sat amongst um, these people here, but uh, there we are. Um, a pig farmer based in Hampshire. Uh, this is my 13th year in, in farming. I've been sort of farming mainly. I worked in the feed industry for a year and a half, and as of two weeks ago, I'm now a tenant farmer. So I guess I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm an actual farmer now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Like I said, I've been uh, mainly doing uh, pig farming off the back of doing a week a week's work experience on a, uh, on a mixed farm. I ended up laying concrete all week, and I got a job there in the end. And I've not looked back since with regards to pigs. All my assignments at uni were pig-based. And um, yeah, I, I, I'd say in the industry, I'm fairly, fairly vocal. Um, some people call me a, a protagonist. Um, I try and poke, poke the bear as much as I can just to get people thinking outside the box and um, yeah, hopefully we can have a good discussion. Great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Westaway. Um, I wear a variety of hats. And I wear, I'm not sure. Go further, closer or further? Further. I actually don't really need this in this room. But um, although the guy from Breeder is actually louder than me, wherever James is. But um, oh my God. Um, so, so various things. Um, we're um, county council farms, like um, um, Flavian. Um, we have today we have we farm 195 acres on the Gloucestershire estate. Um, two thirds of it is in level two countryside stewardship. One third isn't, and we'll probably talk about why as we as we go along. Um, we have a pedigree herd of Aberdeen Angus and Murray Greys, and we'll probably talk about why well, we got Murrays a bit later. Um, so delighted to be here. I'm also chairman of Innovation for Agriculture, um, and, and they've put this on today, so I'm very proud of the team, and we'll talk about that a bit later. I also sit on two bodies for DEFRA about eradicating TB, because it remains the blight of our industry, so we've got some good news on that. We'll probably cover that off as well. Um, chairman of the Gloucester Farm Tenants Association, and um, we decided to go farming to waste our children's inheritance. Um, and um, actually we're quite profitable, so we haven't wasted enough, we need to try harder. But delighted to be here, and um, thank you for everybody for staying and listening to the nonsense that will come out of us for, I'm sure. Stephen. I'm, I'm not gonna say very much other than actually a trilogy of county council tenants, that must be a rare thing. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and like Flavian, I'm still working out how to do it as well <laughs> as a new entrant 15 years later. So, you know, we, we're, all, we're all trying to adapt our farming systems to, to move forward. But I'm not going to say anything more because you sort of heard about what I, I was doing earlier on. 
Brilliant, thank you all. So I'm going to um, start with a really, well, soft and easy question, hopefully. Um, hopefully the answer isn't nothing, because um, the answer is, what's been your biggest learning from today that you're going to take home and apply on your farm or your business? And whoever wants to go first can go first. Okay, so I mean, I think my two, two learnings for me, um, what one is general, one is um, a bit more specific. Um, to me, it's all um, what I've, and I was sort of aware of it anywhere, but, but Helen talked about it earlier in the very first paper that I saw, because I was late as well, I got stuck on the motorway. Me and Abby Reader were sort of hanging around up there. Is, um, it's all about balance, and we need, we need to be aware of that. We need to th think about that we've got this balance of, of making sure that, that what my grandchildren um, have is a better world than we have today, and they don't have to worry about climate change, or if they do, they're managing it, yet we've still got to feed everybody. So I think that's my, my one takeaway on that. My individual takeaway is, is I wasn't aware that you can have an AD plant for a hundred cow farm, and you can, and the gentleman was here, and he will be coming to see me hopefully in the next couple of weeks, because um, as a county council tenant, we'll come back to that, we have a real social responsibility to keep those county council farms in place to um, give people like me and Stephen and Flavian a chance. And actually, anything we can do to show that we're working with the environment and we're getting closer to net zero as quick as we can. Thinking, so actually, that was one thing. I didn't know that AD plant technology was at that level. And we have 150 cows. So that's a really huge positive for me. Uh, so I was taking notes during the day. And uh, I guess uh, it's, uh, I was reminded it was 12 months since the, uh, I got a chance to be the author of the uh, Decarbonising the Cereal Sector Report. I can't believe that's 12, 12 months away. Now, a lot of the feedback from that I still think is valid today in that a lot of people have said to me, oh, is that what that word means? Is that what that concept means? And we didn't know that was possible. I think a lot of that has still come out today. Um, but I still think, uh, switching to put my consultant's hat on, hat on, I have the hairs on the back of my neck standing up because the terms net zero and carbon neutral were bandied about like there was no tomorrow. It seemed you could choose any definition possible. And I think it's really important for our industry because I think we could be in danger of lowering our expectations if we don't get those words correct. So, for example, I've got down here, just calculating how much you're sequestering doesn't mean you're, mean you're helping mitigate climate change. If you work out that you had land for 20, 30 years, 40, 50 years, there's no point working out how much carbon you're sequestering in that because that's simply balancing what you're doing on your farm. That is not going to have any impact in improving the, the planet because all the calculations have been worked out on how much additional carbon do we now need to save to stop the planet warming. That carbon that's in your land already has already been taken account of. Slightly negative point, but very important. So therefore, my other comment on there was you can't be net zero by buying carbon credits. You can only be carbon neutral. That's buying somebody else's good work. Why, don't, why is that a learning experience for me? It's because I think if we, if we just use those words in there and we think that we're net zero, net zero means you've done everything possible yourself, not relying on any carbon credits anywhere, or you've got to actually take new carbon out of the atmosphere. So an old grassland is not taking new carbon, it's taking the old carbon out. But we've got a huge opportunity uh, in, in the sector. The cereal sector is one that I, I try and encourage <laughs> to, uh, to think about this. They have got the capacity of actually reversing climate change if ever, in the UK. The impact of climate change in the UK could be reversed if we improved our soil organic matter. So even though I've banged on about the terms being wrong and, and been used in the wrong way, I say it positively because I think we need to think about where's, who's capturing that additional carbon and all the things we've heard about today, there's a lot of additional carbon we can capture, but don't spend so much time calculating what's happening on, old, on your old land, work out how much is being captured on your new land. And there's been lots of that today, lots of new technologies and opportunities for doing it. Uh, I would say, uh, as of probably last year or year before last, I felt like my, my love for farming was diminishing because sort of working, well, being an employee, just doing what you've got to do. And I think since starting to learn more about um, uh, net zero and farming, uh, farming generatively going to pasture-fed pork courses, I feel like my 
my love for farming has increased and after today I see that there's so much more I need to learn that I feel like I've got like a, a second life in farming I left to work for feed industry because I was bored of sort of the job I was doing. I wasn't learning anything, I wasn't challenged enough. I'm, I'm sure as many people have told me, getting a council farm, that's, that's a challenge in its own right. Um, and then now to do things to do with net zero and understanding that it's not just like um, a flicking a switch and going from one thing to another, or even use the term offsetting for me. I, I personally see that as almost having like a wound with gangrene on it, covering it with a plaster and hopefully that fixes it. So I think it's such a, such a holistic, um, or we need such a holistic approach to try and improve the environment. And uh, for me personally, learning all these things people, people are talking about today, Steve's doing on his farm, oh, not Steve, uh, uh, Simon's doing on his farm, I'm enjoying that, that journey. And um, yeah, I think. I suppose my take, it's loud, isn't it? <laughs> it's like the worst boy band ever sat up here, isn't it? <laughs> um, sorry, I, could, I couldn't resist that. Uh, my take home is, I guess, for today is, this journey to net zero, it's not easy. It really is not easy. It's going to be a bumpy ride for everyone. And actually, what it means on everybody's varied and diverse farms in this room is going to be different. Um, and, you know, it was John, John F. K. said, we're going to the moon. And there were knowns, there were unknowns, and when there were unknowns that didn't even know existed. And, and it feels a bit like that on this journey. Um, uh, there, are, there, are, there are challenges on our farms, there are challenges throughout the supply chain, and, and as farmers we need safe, manageable steps. And I think events like this are, are, are helping us at least provide some of the, the joined up thinking and, and joining the dots within that, within that process. And I guess one of the things that um, my take home is today is if you're on this journey, surround yourself with people who are also on that journey because together as farmers we know about innovation we know about taking risks we know about transitioning and and the more we surround ourselves with others that are on the same journey i think it it, it makes those steps a little bit more straightforward perfect i almost feel like we should have like a row of high stools now like take that or something and so you know um Great. Have we got any questions from the floor? No one's been backwards, yes. No one's been backwards in coming forward so far, so uh, questions would be very much welcomed. If you could introduce yourself as well, say who you are and uh, where you're from, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, my name's Chris Taylor. I'm from Abergavenny, and I'm actually here as part of my Nuffield Scholarship. Uh, as I've been travelling, um, I think one of the things I've noticed is there's a lot of really innovative farmers out there Perhaps what we could be guilty of in the UK is not sharing that information well enough with other people who uh, who would benefit from it, and we can turn into what um, gets coined as an echo chamber a little bit, where the people in this room are all very engaged, but it's not getting out to the wider public. Um, I had a question earlier, which was around how we can farm in a more sort of green way when a lot of farmers are in the red, and I suppose there's a, a double barrel here, but how would you... How would you go about getting the information that's being gained on a lot of these farms onto, uh, onto more, more farms? And what are your thoughts around how people could be incentivized to have the confidence to go out and try these, these innovative practices? Yeah, so, so great question. So I mean, if, from, from a personal point of view, so last night I did a, a talk to 100 members of the Young Greens and, and they, they're really engaged in this. So, so the first thing is um, any opportunity you get to communicate, the better. But I, th I think that the, and it was a bit held up with, um, with COVID, but I think the sort of the focus farms and there are various AHDB have some farms that are there as champion farms. And I know there's a new project um, that Innovation for Agriculture are gonna run. And I think that's 45 farms, which is, uh, 
130 show farms or that sort of thing and I think that's the that's the way to do it so I go to every um, farm walk I can if I can because you always learn you always learn something so I think we've got to make it accessible um, for people to go and see stuff themselves so for example in the last breeding group we were in um, the grazing system we have at home of three-day moves and fencing I went and saw Sarah's here somewhere I went to one of Sarah's talks and that's how we learned it on a farm so I think I think making it accessible making it friendly making it not threatening some people aren't very comfy sitting in a in a meeting room or a skit and alley being um, lectured at but most people love a farm walk so I think that whole system that we're putting in place with IFA will be an enormous step forward. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, for my sins, I sit on uh, the Red Tractor Cereals board, and I, they, they know, I think, there that, that the hairs on the back of my neck stand up when, that, when, when they start talking about, when they end up you saying, our members are saying that nobody knows about this stuff. What do you mean nobody knows about it? Well, it never gets talked about, this, the, all the innovation that's out there. It's complete nonsense, of course. I think it's, you know, it's, it's the people that are saying that are a vocal minority, I think, actually. Because if you look at farmers, uh, so I, I set up my first farmer group in 2013, 200 farmers there, actually, and we tell them to say it quietly, have said, we don't need a subsidy because all this regenerative agriculture is making us far more money than we're making before. Now, we tell them to be quiet on that about the subsidy because they're the leaders in their field. We want them to shout about it, but those who are not convinced will need that subsidy. They'll need whatever's coming through Elms and all the rest of it. But there are not enough of that. So they've been going now for 10 years. Um, they'll tell you the financial benefits. We even had a group of farmers. They were in Yorkshire to start with, these farmers. And they didn't. Uh, they said, oh, no, we don't believe any of this stuff. Some farmers from Holland came across, put a whole set of metrics up, and they, they were, yeah, that's OK, that's OK. What's this one here? You're 36% happier. How the heck do you know that? He said, well, my wife's told me I'm not as grumpy when I'm doing, <laughs> doing regenerative agriculture. But you know, that one metric they've mentioned time and time again, they said they've made new friends, they've learned new things, they've learned what works, they've learned what doesn't work, and that's the way, I think. We don't shout enough about it. You see too much negative stuff uh, in the press that it's not going to work, and yet you've got groups of farmers um, I think in the last six months I've talked to 1,500 or 1,600 farmers about the benefits of regenerative agriculture. In two weeks' time I'm going to give that exact same lecture to the distilling industry because they're saying they haven't heard it before. And yet there's been a lot said about it. <laughs> well, it was my wife wondering if I was 35% happy or not. <laughs> I, I agree there with um, I, I, the point you make, Chris, about people not, not wanting to share knowledge and almost like you've got farmers next door to each other and people try and look over the hedge and see what someone else is doing. If they're doing it wrong, they'll either not do what they've done so they don't do or get the same results. And I've, I've found as a young-ish farmer, now I'm over 30, I don't think I can get called young anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I recently set up a group in the southeast um, called Next Generation. I think we're, or some people say, this generation. And um, we plan to meet up at least once a quarter or even more often if we can and just go on farm walks and learn. Because I think a lot of people my age or people that I've talked to would probably not want to come to something like this because it is intimidating, as you say. But if you're going to go, go, go on a farm walk, see what everyone else is doing, and then, I don't know, go for a pint or two late in the evening, people feel way more comfortable there because one, they might not feel judged or um, being in a farm environment is more comfortable than being sat here dressed like I, I am. Well, I like dressing in a suit, some people might not do, prefer being jeans and dealers. So I think it's probably finding the different ways people learn from each other to try and get to that goal rather than just assuming everyone wants to go to a conference or um, meet up in a formal form away like this it's not often I say these words but actually deferrer to be applauded natural England to be, to be applauded on on the principle of the facilitation fund because I think where they've been put in place they work really well and you know farmers learn be best from the experience of other farmers and I think I think targeting resources and facil and resources to enable facilitations to be run 
is going to be really key because as farmers ourselves we're busy and we don't necessarily have the time we're busy farmers we don't necessarily have the time to do the organization of events and and providing that that structure and facilitation to allow someone to organize book places organize farm walks etc is going to be really key to go forward um, uh, uh, so you know all power to their elbow and I think if they could expand that program so that farmers are recognized for for that exchange of knowledge between peers is going to be really key Brilliant, thank you all. And certainly in uh, those of us um, who are in the breeding group, I think we heard variations of that same question over and over again. How do we get to everybody else, not just the engaged people who are here? Um, who are here. Next question, everyone else has got a question. Yes, Lisa. Ooh. <laughs> what is the one thing you're gonna do differently now on your farms? Um. <laughs> there's, there's no more bandwidth. <laughs> my, my output from today, I've said it already, we're, we're going to look at AD. I mean, I, I just wasn't aware that it was available at that sort of scale. Um, and we have a new tenant moving in next door. Like that's, we've just let the next door farm. Um, and he's really innovative and his, and his part, wife to be is, is very innovative. I can see between the two of us, we'll have 200 cows. Um, I could see that being really real benefit. The other thing is I need to think a bit harder about herbal lays. And I've spoke to some of the guys on that. So I, we have got some herbal lays at the minute. I need to think about that probably a little bit more. So can I have two, Lisa? Disappointed if I had them, would you, yeah? So I, I'm, after a conversation uh, over coffee, I'm going to explore the use of fenceless uh, grazing systems and collars, uh, which um, I, I haven't found them yet to fit on earthworms so I can restrict where they go but 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 I think that there are opportunities out there that are untapped which fit quite well with the kind of things that we're doing now. Uh, I would say um, uh, going onto a new farm I'm going to do targeted soil sampling so looking up all the maps I've checked online of the farm that I'm going to it's just got one massive some type of soil and I know uh, the way the previous farmer had managed it we've got a third of the farm that has been a yard for 40 years so it's just had horses and horses and horses whereas the other ones done I had beef and sheep on rotation so I've talked to a few people today I'm definitely going to do targeted soil testing to treat each field differently rather than just have a blanket um, treatment of the whole farm. Okay, well, as I said, I'm, I'm not a farmer, but I, I get in, <laughs> engaged with a lot of uh, farmers. For me, I'm, I'm, I've been looking today for, for new ways of, of engaging across the farm because it's very much, you know, you can be with the cereal farmers, they're very focused on cereals. They generally don't bring any livestock discussions into the, um, in, into the forum. So again, from what I, as one of my purposes from coming today, not just being on the panel, but to listen to what the other parts of the farm were talking about. There's a lot of interesting stuff. So that's meant that for, up here for me, there are now more questions I can ask them to see if they can bring that into this discussion so we can have a whole farm discussion, not just on cereals. Brilliant, and if I can add mine, I'm going to try and find data to answer all of those questions where we don't have data yet, like animal health and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, time for one, possibly two, if they're quick questions. Uh, we've got one right at the back. Hi, Michelle. Um, we've talked a lot about methane emissions from cattle. Do you guys believe that methane emissions from cattle are really a problem, or is it just a lack of understanding or a lack of measuring? Can I take that one first as a cereal uh, uh, guy? Because I've seen some really impressive results coming from some cereal growers where if they're changing what they're feeding to those cows, uh, you, d you don't need the, uh, the persistence of methane to sort of take, take away the, uh, uh, the intensity of it. You can actually reduce it by a, lot, by a lot of the ways that you feed the cows in the first place. Uh, it, quite impressive. You know, you're looking at something like about 40 to 50% reduction in methane without putting any, and I'm not decrying any of the other feeds that you can give to reduce the methane, but just even with ordinary uh, you know, grasslands, whatever, there's some pretty impressive figures. But how often do we hear that? I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, I've never seen that. And I think this is the problem, coming back to your point over there. That stuff doesn't get put out enough. So I think we need to hear more of those case studies because there, there are lots of options we already have to reduce that methane. 
Yeah, I, I, in terms of, it's well we're setting the boundaries. You know, the, the uh, ignoring the uh, sequestration from different grassland management systems and only looking at the emissions is only half, you know, one side of the coin. Uh, and, and we've got to get much more nuanced about actually including the, both the feeding regimes but also the, the grazing regimes and the, the herbage management into that equation, which currently, because of the lack of data, um, those assumptions are, are skewing the conversation in one particular direction in a negative way when I think, you know, manage right, uh, grass and systems can be very much part of the answer. Yeah, and, and for me, great question. Um, I think there's, there's two bits I would add. I would agree exactly what the, the felon panelists have said. Two things is, um, genetic, I'm a beef farmer. Genetic progress in beef cattle in this country is a disgrace um, compared, compared to our dairy, chicken, and pig friends. So there's an awful lot we can do there. One of the great ways of reducing methane is actually make the blooming things more efficient in the first place. So I think we've got some big ground to do there. Um, and absolutely, and there's, some, there's also some really early work on genetic markers on this sort of stuff as well. So using the right, right balls, that will have an impact. So I, I'm not over comfy with some of the measurement, but I, I'm exactly with Matt. I think there are some tools, so I think we, could, we can deal with it. Okay, got time for one last question. Um, Darren from DEFRA, who's again boxed himself in, so I can't run. Um, <laughs> he did, I was about to say thank you for that. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for this event. Uh, I think it's been absolutely fantastic, so I'll, I'll just say that now. Um, and it's been great to hear everything. What, one of the... Interesting that you used the NASA example of JFK, because when he stood up at Rice University, I did an exchange with NASA a number of years ago, and they loved telling the story that when he stood up, there was no evidence whatsoever no data, no person saying it could be done. He just simply stood up and said it. And that day, the NASA administrator at the time went to the Oval Office with his resignation and said, because I can't do it. And he said, but I just stood up. So all the resources, manpower, and support you need, you're now going to get. So in that light, government has many roles as a convener, as a commissioner, as a regulator, as a legislator, all the roles you can think of. What role do you think government irrespective of politics, has in this, and what would you like to see really driven and delivered at pace? As this has been a consistent theme through the day in the sessions I've been. So, I mean, this is, a, this is a, probably a Weasley answer, but, you know, create an enabling environment for change, and, 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 and as part of that, it's taking away some of the risks to allow those safe, safe steps by farm, farmers. And, and, and that means you know, a light touch in terms of the RPA and regulation and things like that, that actually re a recognition that we're trying to move in the right direction and we will make mistakes. So, so a culture of allowing mistakes but not penalisation, I think, will help in that, in that trajectory of change. Uh, because at the moment, I think we're in a, in a culture of penalisation uh, and, and farmers not wanting to take risks and take mistakes in case they're the wrong ones and they get penalised. So it's a culture shift, I think, is going to be the biggest thing that we can, we can try and work towards. Yeah, I would echo all that. I mean, I think absolutely the ability to change and the encouragement to do it. I think um, absolutely some of the, the regulation is, is, is a bit onerous. The, the, the dream of Brexit that everything was going to be easier has proved to be what it was, what it was. a bit like the, the numbers on the side of the bus, but we won't be political. But... Um, but that sort of thing. And I think the other thing is, and I'll give you a classic of it, there's a, and he's not here today, there's a gentleman called Simon Bainbridge who's very active on Twitter. He's an absolute superstar, one of the best farmers in the country. He had his red tractor insurance last week and he had an ear tag inspection this week. I mean, come on. You know, absolute waste of time. So I would say it's enablement. Um, I'm pretty close to DEFRA and actually I think you're doing a great job. Um, and I think the one thing that, that we need um, our minister, so Mark Spencer, is we need to stand up a bit more for UK food and food security than we currently are. That's, that's the big bit. And um, because um, we make great food, we have the highest standards in the world. I'm lucky enough I travel all over the place and absolutely it is that. So, so keep banging on that door. So if that means Mark Spencer's got to annoy Teresa Coffey, get on with it because it, need, it, need, it needs doing. But no, enablement, I think, and, and let us... This industry knows how to sort its problems. Help us and let us do it. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'd echo what um, uh, both of you have said there. And also, I think, um, especially as a big farmer, I'm going to try and be as positive as I can here, um, is that I've seen sometimes as if farmers or people in agriculture are involved way too late to when things are being put out that are going to affect us. So I think whether it's in um, a recruitment in people that are going to be working in, uh, in the ministry or in DEFRA, having people there that have that sort of direct, not necessarily direct contact, but knowledge of how it works. Because if you're having like an, an inspection, let's say Red Tractor or RSPCA, and um, I like an example, I've got, last year we had an, uh, an RSPCA inspection and I'm being told we can't sell pork in a farm shop as RSPCA accredited because the closest abattoir to us, half an hour away, doesn't have an RSPCA assurance, but I can go an hour and a half away so I can get that accreditation. You've got, we talk about net zero, I've gone a longer journey there, more stress for the animal welfare, and asking why that is, the, the person shrugged their shoulder and said, that's what the paper says. And I think in some instances we can use logic and being a species that we deem ourselves as the most intelligent species, some things we do, I think we're the complete opposite. Um, so I think my main point in a long-winded way is having farmers involved in the whole process and not just at the end, because it's too late then. And I think if I, <clears throat> there was a, when the Climate Change Committee published its, uh, its net zero report a few years back, it, it, only, it only took a week for people to be calling it the not zero report. Very unkind, it was not a bad report. It, of course it was flawed, but there were some really good bits in it. But then we had a review in January of how's it going, and it was quite depressing, apart from one particular section. It was depressing because it said, look, we know all these things that we have to do. I said, we've known that for 20 years, and the report said that. The biggest block was government departments not speaking to each other. There was one part in there which I thought was just a light, for the, particularly for us in here, and it was on voluntary, car, voluntary carbon market. Previously, the, 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 the government departments have said, we are not going to use those if anyone, and we'll all need credits to get to, to, to be carbon neutral. There is not enough technology to get there, whichever we're in. So we're going to need these credits. But they had excluded the voluntary carbon market, which is all the carbon that we can generate, the carbon credits we can generate. There was one section in there that said, we think we need to fast track this, but fast track is not fast enough. We need those incentives, we need the rules. There are some rules around already for how you calculate carbon credits. I get a little bit fed up when people say it's the Wild West and you can say whatever you like. It's not. But government needs to un underpin that. It's saying we need to develop a new strategy. So one of my feedbacks to, to them on that was, don't reinvent the wheel. It's already there. Your own departments have got some of these in place. So that's what I'd like to see. What I've seen DEFRA move really quick was uh, in the Yorkshire group, they listened to what farmers and uh, walkers and shooters and the water authorities all said. And they said, you know what? You're doing that better by yourselves. We'll just facilitate it. And that is a really good model to follow. Just it fast-tracked it. And they said, we'd have taken years to get there. So a great job, but I just wish that you had more influence, if you like, in, in, in uh, particularly with the Treasury, trying to get them to invest more. So this is a call to action, I guess. And it's a question. Hands up who's had an MP on their farm in the last 12 months. It's not very many of you. It's in your hands. A call to action is get your MP on your farm because it's them that will influence DEFRA to make these kind of changes that we're seeking. So it's a call to action. It's not hard. They will come, especially if you make it relevant. You know, there's going to be electioneering coming up fairly soon. Uh, uh, and, um, and they'll all want your vote. Get them there now while they're not too busy. Talk to them about these things we've talked about today. Influence them, get them to talk to DEFRA because that's the way we'll see change. Brilliant, so listen, engage, common sense and UMPs on your farms. Excellent end to this. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everybody who's here, everybody who's been involved with this. This has been about 12 months, maybe more in the planning I think countless Zooms and Teams calls, 
absolute sterling work from absolutely everybody, everybody here, everyone behind the scenes, everyone who's been on the calls, everyone who's written the reports, have been authors on the reports, please download a copy from the website and read it. I, um, any errors in the uh, intensive meet one are entirely mine, so I apologise for them in advance if you can find any. Um, it's been a real pleasure. So, in your email, probably as of now, but if not in the next few minutes, you should have a survey, and if you could possibly give your feedback, that would be really valuable. I know you get these from every conference and every time you go to a supermarket and everything else, but it's really, really useful for us to know what we've done right, what we've done wrong, whether we should do it again, what we should do in future, um, and it also keeps um, the funders happy, which is always really important with putting on these events. So I'd like to thank everybody very, very much for making the time to come and for being part of this and I'm just going to hand over to Paul to wrap up. Yep, so I have the best job of the day. Um, I get to say thank you to everybody. So I am Chairman of Innovate for Agriculture and the team have put today on. Um, I'm really, really proud of you guys. You've done an amazing job. Um, I go to lots of these things. I think this is the best conference I've been to for about five years. It really is. It's been fabulous. So, so to all the Innovation for Agriculture team, very thank you very much. Big thank you to Harper Adams for hosting us. Big thank you to Jude and all the chairman um, and chair people. Big thank you to all the speakers. But more importantly, big thank you to you. I've, it's been really positive, really engaging. Um, I think it's been a fabulous day. And um, let us know if you'd like us to do this again. Um, this was um, enabled by the Dulverton Trust, um, RASE. All we did is Innovation for Agriculture. We, we facilitated and put this on. If you like a day like this, please let us know in your surveys. Um, and the last bit is to wish you all a very safe journey home. Join me on the queue going down the M6, M5, those of you going that way. Well, I might go to Ludlow tonight, actually. And um, very safe trip home. I'm really proud that we've had a day like today. And I take Stephen's point. This isn't easy, but we can do it. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a very safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you.